How should I choose blades, guards, and shears? What makes them different, special, and appropriate? And any tips on keeping them cool? Um, so this is a this is a good question. Um, they're all personal preference, right? We have so many blades, guards, everything that are that are coming out. Uh, things are changing really rapidly. You know, back when I started in dogs, like there was the Oster A5 and like you had a 10 blade, a 30 blade, some once in a while you got a 40 blade, you know, there was no 7F. So it is um, personal preference, right? Um, you have to decide what works for you, what is comfortable in your hand. Um, and you know, some people like ceramic blades, some people like metal blades. Just like anything, how you look after your equipment is really, really important. So if you can keep your clipper blades in a box, if you can keep your guards in a box, if you can keep your clippers under good maintenance. Um, I like to always use like cool lube when I'm clipping. So if I'm clipping a poodle and you're saying that you have a problem with your blades getting hot because it takes you a long time, and this is um, a common complaint that I, that I well, not a complaint, a co common problem, right? In the beginning, uh, you don't wanna use a hot blade. A hot blade causes more razor burn, but in the beginning, you're not as fast so that there's more chance that you are gonna get a hotter blade, right? We've all exactly been there. So here are my tips. First of all, if I'm going to be using a 30 blade or a 40 blade, I typically use a 40 blade on my poodle. I'm going to have at least three blades to clipper my poodle. And for other blades, like for a 30 and down, I will use a sharpened blade. I rarely, rarely have my 40 blade sharpened. I like to buy new ones and that might be wrong, but that's I've had the best success with that. Um, it is a really, really close blade. You're gonna make sure that you're always clipping on clean hair because with those 40 blades, right? Because as soon as there's a little bit of dirt or dander, it just makes everything heat up a lot faster. So I'm gonna have three blades and I'm going to keep the blades that I'm not using on the floor. Typically the floor is the coolest place. Also, you can't knock them off a counter. So I am going to use cool lube as I start clipping my dog. I'm gonna spray my clipper with clipper lube and I'm going to clipper and I'm gonna keep feeling my blade, right? So typically I'm gonna feel it like on my arm. Sometimes I'm even gonna feel it on my cheek to see um, if it is getting hot. As soon as I think it's getting hot, I'm gonna switch it out for one and I'm gonna keep the new hot blade as soon as I take the blade off, well, before I take it off, I'm going to spray it with cool lube on the front, spray it with cool lube on the back, take it off, put it on the cool spot on the floor, get my new cool blade and continue. So I hope that's how I do it, but I always have like three good blades to start my trimming of my dog. Um, for salon trims, are there rules for where to start clipping? Should I start at the neck, then go down the back? How about the legs, the muzzle, the bum? What blade do I use where? And should I opt for blades rather than combs? Um, so I like to start at the back of the neck. So if I'm gonna leave like a fuller neck, I might start at the withers. If it's something that I'm not leaving a fuller neck on, um, I am going to start right at the back of the head. Um, and I am going to do the body first, right? I figure if I get the body at the shape that I want, then I can then balance how big or small my legs are going to be, right? So I'm going to start at the back, either at the withers, if I'm leaving neck hair on them, or at the back of the head, you know, maybe like three fingers down from the back of the head, so I have room to blend that in. And I'm gonna go from there down towards the tail and then down, getting most of the body starting at the top and going down, right? Then once I have that, I'm going to do the legs. Again, starting at the top and going down and making sure that I'm always slickering in between passes of the clippers. The same thing with the muzzle. Make sure that the muzzle is combed out. I'm either clipping it with like a number 10 blade or I am going to be scissoring it with some thinning shears or blenders. Um, the same with the bum. I like to keep the bum, you know, the sanitary area nicely done with a 10 blade if I'm doing a salon trim. And so I'm gonna use the 10 blade um, around their feet, on the muzzle and around the bum. And then I like to do the body with about a four 
F or a five um, to get the body nice and, and short. And then I might use a clipper comb on the legs, right? Like I'm gonna make sure the legs are completely combed out and that is where I would use a clipper comb. Um, how do I go from a continental clip to a German clip? Uh, well, this is a good question. So two schools of thought are you could basically let your dog grow in from continental. So continental would have all the legs shaped quite close, you know, wait two months and then put the dog into the German trim that would then look really pretty. For me, this is way too much work. I am just going to set the pattern for the German clip bada bing, bada boom, right off, right? So I'm just going to have that picture of the German trim in my grooming room and I'm just gonna start with my dog in Continental. And of course it's going to look weird because there are going to be places where there are no coat, but within a month it's all, you know, I would take the legs again shorter than normal until it starts to grow in. So I would maybe take the body down with like a five and just like do the same with the legs in the beginning, just because it's gonna take a while for that closely clipped coat from the Continental to grow out to where it's starting to look plush and more like a pet trim. I'm just gonna have another little water break. Papillons, any tips on how to grow and maintain coat, especially for bitches? What products do you like for keeping a papillon coat moisturized on a daily basis? Uh, so I like to use a bristle brush on my papillons, like a Mason Pearson or the, um, the, Mace, the Mason Pearson knockoff that Chris Christensen has. And I'm going to, whenever I am brushing, up, especially a papillon, they have such brittle kind of flyaway coat. I'm always going to make sure that I have some like high, hydro pack, hypro pack mixed up in a spray bottle with water so I can just keep them moisturized. Um, the other thing is I might give them a little mist of moisturizer as they come in and I'm going to stop sharing my screen. So uh, if you can see the lovely Fifi here again, so say I have my spray bottle and I'm going to have um, any kind of conditioner mixed with water, but like hydro, the Miracle Cream or the Hydro Pack I would use. And then like as my pap so my papillon, I'm not grooming it today, but I might just give it a little bit of a mist like this, like all over the dog, just to get that moisture into the coat. Um, and I find especially on bitches, they need this. Also, don't be afraid to use some kind of like coat supplement. Um, uh, you know, like Super 14 or something just to like encourage that coat growth. Um, I also have a couple recipes that you could email me for, we just don't have time to go over it right now, for um, helping to grow coat completely natural. And oh, trying to get to the next slide. Oh, maybe I went. Okay, now I'm the one having a technical difficulty. It's fine. I think you want to be on slide 28. Oh, so that's where I am? Yeah. Um, uh, so I have an English springer with less than optimal rib spring. What are some grooming tips to make the rib spring look better? And any tips for making the bib coat look fuller? Uh, yes, so this is a great question. Um, I showed a lot of English cockers. Some had optimal rib, rib spring, some did not. So what I would do is once I am done my, my show bath and, you know, I have my dog on the table, I would um, take a mousse that sprays out like um, coat dressing. And this is what I would do if I can stop sharing here for one moment. So um, I'm gonna use, oh, this is the wrong one. Hmm. And I did take the other one out because I knew that this question was on the slide and now I can't, oh, here it is. Sorry again for seeing my armpit. Um, so here we go. So I'm gonna use coat dressing. Coat dressing is basically just like mousse in an aerosol form, but this is why I like it for this kind of question. So obviously Fifi here is not a springer, but if we could see her. So once I have my dog on the table and like, you know, I traditionally you're just gonna dry the coat like this. But what I would do is I would back brush 
all of the ribs so I'm going against the grain not with the grain and because the coat dressing I'm going to try to do it closer to my computer comes out like a mist it get again I'm going to shoot from the back of my dog so it's getting like under those areas and it's just going to help create that body so I'm going to then dry this backwards um, so that it's creating that body and then lightly smooth it down and that is something that you could refresh right before you went in the ring is to create that extra body is back brush it and like so you're going against the grain traditionally with like setters cockers spaniels we go like the jacket part we're going with the grain back brush it get that mousse underneath there again you could use any mousse you can put the mousse in your hand and, and work it in with your fingers completely fine I just find with the like mist of the coat dressing that that does just help get it into the coat a little bit better into every little part of the rib spring but again you could just use plain old everyday mousse if you had it um, same thing for making the bib look fuller so for the bib um we're going to assume that the the bib well it's a springer so the bib's white and again i'm going to put mousse in there and then i'm going to fill it full of like some baby powder or cornstarch or mixed baby powder and cornstarch like 50 50 and really get it in there and dry it and again instead of drying it down and smooth which you would traditionally do i'm going to dry it up backwards against the grain and just smooth down the outer layer And I'm trying to get this to go to 29 and for some, there we go. How can I get that great underline on springers? Um, and when is longer not better for underlines? And how long is too long for underlines, i.e. weighing them down? Okay, so underline on our springers, our spaniels, our setters, um, on anything, it's stacking them. So many people do not stack their dogs. So their dogs are slouching, they're not in the proper outline. So typically, um, the only way I am can ever really trim an underline is to have somebody stack it and stack it properly right up over like it is in a show stack and you're getting the best show photo you have ever gotten in your entire life. Like that's the only way to do it. And once you have your dog all stacked up, um, then do the underline and you're gonna do it with thinning shears and you're gonna remember that the underline starts. So the underline, oh, I'm gonna use this fancy thing again. I wish I could make this a different color though, I think. Um, yeah, okay. So remember the underline, if you're looking on the slide, the underline starts here and it goes under and then it keeps going switching fingers up like this all the way down here and all the way to the hawk is all part of the underline right again this angle down here at the pastern also has to be in relation to that underline in some way shape or form this cannot be a completely see how this underline here is why did that stop um this underline here see how it's oh i have no idea what i'm doing now but this underline here, see how it's nice and curvy, just like this is. This can't be like a straight line and then this be a curvy line. They have to, um, they have to correlate in some way, shape or form. So having your dog properly stacked, it always takes two people to do the underline. And longer is, is never better, right? Because longer does bring, you want to have that daylight underneath your dog. So you have to look at your dog in size and proportion. Again, this is a great time to have a vision board, to have a dog that is the same make and shape, most likely from the same family as your dog that you really like the trim and like match it up especially change your underline moving outside into grass, right? The grass does make our dogs look shorter, have look like they have a shorter underline. Um, look at your dog's underline. We groom them, groom them, groom them on a grooming table, but we never look at them on the floor. And that is really, really important to look at our dogs on the floor because that is how the judge sees them. The judge doesn't see our English Springers on a grooming table. So if that's the only place that you are grooming, um, the underline, then you really need to look at it on the floor. But it does need to be stacked. It does take two people and thinning shears to do the underline, never straight shears. And for some reason, this no longer wants to show. Yes, I would really like you to show the next page. 
Um, maybe because I had that clicked. Don't know. There we go. Uh, my dog's neck and shoulders just blend together. No definition of a shoulder angulation. How can I add definition? Oh, this is a great question. I don't really know why I didn't notice it before. And I don't know that Fifi. All right, we'll try it on Fifi and see how it goes. Okay. So the question, okay, I'm actually going to, I'll go back to the slide later. I should have done it first on the slide. Okay. But we will go back to that slide and I'll show you what I mean. So we want, so basically the picture that she showed us looks kind of like Fifi here. There is no definition between like how the shoulder angulation is built in and the top of the leg. So what I like to do is this is all going to be bathed and dried properly. And I am going to use my Coat King knife first. So again, it's that big fat coarse coat knife. And so here is Fifi's angulation and here is the top of the leg, right? So like right now, we can't even see the top of, so I'm just gonna give Fifi the top of the leg here, just so that we can see what we're doing. So we want to take this and we want to run it on the angle of the shoulder, pulling all of this hair out in the direction that we want it to go. I'm holding that bib hair out of the way, right, so that I don't accidentally strip off some of this, but I'm just going to have that angle of the shoulder exposed and I'm going to strip this out, right? Once I have it stripped out with my rake, I am then going to switch to my knife. So I stripped out the bulk of it with the Coat King. Now I'm switching to my classic knife and I'm just, I'm still holding this chest hair out of the way and I'm going to pull all the way along. So like from where the point of shoulder is down to the top of the leg, I'm going to pull that with my stripping knife in the direction that I want it to go. The last step that you're going to do is you're going to take your thinning shears and again, you're going to follow that angulation with your thinning shears and you're going to take it off so that you have the angulation coming down into the top of the leg. Always make sure there is definition at the top of the leg, right? So that is how we show that shoulder angulation. We just hold this bib hair out of the way and run down the actual angle, starting with a coarse coat king, a stripping knife where we're pulling that hair as tight as we can, and then tidying up at the end with thinning shears. You don't want to really just go in there with thinning shears like I did on Fifi, but you know, Fifi doesn't really have legs, so. We had to improvise. Um, but I will show you here. So if we, right here is, well, why won't this be what I want it to be? Right here is the top of the leg. And so I would take and I would hold all of this hair here in my hand. And here with the coat king, but I would go in the direction of the angle, right? right? So the shoulder angulation is going to come down here. This is going to be the point of shoulder. Then the return of, nope, the return, okay. Doo -doo. The return of the upper arm is going to look like this, except now it hates me. Problem is just because it thinks you like want to click on that. So either just like start kind of up from the top, like by the lead, or like down by the elbow and do that line that you're trying to do. Oh. Yeah. Okay. So here is the return of upper arm. You get the idea. It should really be about here. And then I'm going to use a coat. I'm going to hold all of this hair out of my way, and I'm going to strip all this with my coat king. And you're going to find the bone that is the angle that you are looking for. And so you're going to strip it with, and again, like all this, there's way too much hair here too. This needs to be all stripped off with your coat king as well, right? To give the flatter look to the side of the shoulder. This will all need to be stripped out under here to give more neck. Um, and then with my Coat King, so that you actually want an angle there. And um, so again, directly under his ear down to his chest, he gets wings that look like viper necks. How can I trim them without getting a straight line cut? Well, again, um, you're going to use your Coat King, right? You're really, really gonna strip it. And basically, 
they, you need to make sure that they're drier. Like so many people with goldens don't get them all the way dry. So the difference between, and then once they're dry, you're gonna go in and trim it again, right? With your coat king. You're just gonna keep at it. And that's gonna get rid of, like I can see all these wings in here. That's gonna get rid of all this because there is no definition around here. Like you can see how this hair is wings. This is all hair that should be stripped off with your coat king and then with your classic knife. Um, how can you avoid trimming the ears too short? You're going to be using thinning shears and you're going to, so like I say, you take five little cuts, then you stop and you slicker them. Then you take five more cuts and that's how you avoid getting them too short. Um, another thing would be to practice right now, because if you do get them too short, it's not really the end of the world, right? If you get them too short right now, you're completely fine. Um, they're going to go back. So now is the time to practice that. Uh, no matter what I do, the hawks don't fluff up like they should. They just hang there looking untrimmed and messy. And how can I get them to look nice, blended, and thick? Um, so here is a picture of her hawks. This is a picture of better hawks. Just unfortunately, it got pixelated when we put it up there. This question only came in this morning, so uh, we didn't have a lot of time to get it up there. So again, um, it's bathing them right? So at home, you need to bathe them with like a really, that's a dirty area. That's their foot. You need to bathe it with a clarifying shampoo. Maybe do it twice. Make sure they are really, really, really dry. And just like we demonstrated with the Springer, um, once you get them to the show, you're going to bucket those hawks out again. So by bucket, I mean, you're going to wash it with shampoo. You're going to rinse it out like in a dish pan. Then you're going to towel it dry. Then you're going to dry it with your forest dryer and maybe even a hot dryer. And you're going to, before you start drying them, you're going to add mousse to really hold them up there. So you're going to add mousse, get them all the way dry, then re-trim them so they have that really plush look. And then you might add some thick and thicker spray or some, if they're a really thin coated dog, you could add some cholesterol and some chalk at this point and re-dry them or some thick and thicker spray to just like hold them up. Thick and thicker is like a light hairspray. So that should help. Um, okay. Oh my goodness. I'm gonna have to have another drink. Now it's an, not a mint, not of gin, of the water. Okay, so now we're gonna go on to the live Q&A. So that is the questions that you have typed in and I'm gonna get through as many of these as possible. Um, if we have, Katie, how do you think we're doing for time? Would we maybe have time to do some webcam stuff? Um, uh, yeah. I think we can. Um, if anybody wants to share their webcam, if you can please um, type a message to panelists at least or in the Q&A if that's not working for you, um, just so we can kind of get a list going and then we'll know who to, um, we have to like promote you and blah, blah, but we'll get there eventually. So yes, please put that in and then Allison, if you can go ahead with the Q&A. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> Okay, so the first question, our mini poodle hates his feet being groomed, bites at the blade. Um, any tips? Okay, so first of all, before you start grooming him, I would get him really, really tired, right? So get him as tired as possible. And um, maybe there's going to be times that you could be sitting there watching TV with him or something relaxing where you just like have the clippers not even on but like near his feet and you're feeding him treats and like getting him used to that. Um, then maybe start doing the same thing. Make sure he's nice and tired before you start and you are in a good mood and ready to do it. I know that this sounds dumb but like and you just have to act like don't act like it's going to be a chore. Like you have to act like this is okay, good boy, like the whole time. You're not fighting with him saying, no, 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 stop it. Say like, good boy, let's get this done. Okay, you're okay. Have somebody else um, giving him treats and say that you're only gonna do one foot, right? Just do one foot so that you don't have to um, just battle him with all four feet. Like that's how I would start. That being said, 
Miniature poodles for whatever reason are the absolute worst variety for doing feet. And I started in miniature poodles and nobody told me this. So like I was seven and I had my first miniature poodle and he used to scream the whole time I did his feet. He was fine when I clipped anything else. And it was really, really awful. And I've always felt horrible. And then I had another miniature poodle and I was bound and determined and he hated getting his feet done. And then I started working on standards and toys like when I started and I couldn't believe how great they were for their feet. And then fast forward to the first miniature poodle I specialed on my own as a professional handler would scream the entire time I clippered all of his feet. He was a multiple specialty winner, multiple best in show winner and screamed the entire time I did his feet for his entire three year career. So uh, yeah, you, good luck. And I think you'll be fine, but don't beat yourself up too much about it. Um, so, what is the preferred product for condition? So um, I know, Kim, that you have a poodle. Um, so I guess I could kind of really want to know what do you mean by condition? I like to use um, after bath on my poodles because I bathe them every week, sometimes twice a week. It cuts down on my drying time and I find it's a good light conditioner. Um, I do like to product hack it with hydro pack if I have something that needs more conditioning. Um, Claudia, what about letting a border collie grow its coat? Um, do they get split ends too? Um, you know, they're not going to get split ends. So, um, you know, I am going to keep up their trim. I am going to keep raking out all of that dead coat. To me, that would be the more important thing, really raking out that dead coat. But, you know, I used to have Shetland Sheepdogs, and if they were getting split ends, like on their tails or around their ruff, I would trim that off with thinning shears. So I hope that helps. Um, Lori asks, how do you trim a natural poodle tail for the show ring if the dog is in modified continental? Um, so Lori, I would, the thing with a natural tail is I do have a tutorial on YouTube about this, but I will try to explain it to you, but you could look at my YouTube tutorial because it's, I think quite good. So the thing about your natural poodle tail is that you want to look at where your dog holds it naturally, right? So where are they holding it when they are standing and they are happy and their tail is up? So then you need to recreate that. So some poodles with a natural tail hold the poodle, the tail quite off the back. So you need to let a lot of the hair in the front of the tail grow. Some of them have a tighter, most poodles with natural tails, it's tighter to the body looking like a gay tail. So therefore you need to let more hair grow on the back of the tail and cut less off or more off underneath. I am always going to spray up my poodle's tail with hairspray, especially a natural length poodle tail to get the shape. So even if you're not gonna use hairspray at the dog show because you are in modified continental, I am at home going to spray use hairspray because that's the only way to get the round look. And then when I'm drawing it for the dog show, again, if you're not gonna use any hairspray in the tail because you are in modified continental, I would add a lot of mousse to it, do some back combing. Um, but yes, you have to look, use hairspray at least at home to help you get the shape. Uh, so Nancy, are you trimming with thinning shears? Um, I'm assuming you're talking about one of the springers. Yes, I'd be trimming with thinning shears. Uh, Lindsay asks, would you trim papillon ear fringe? Um, no, I would never trim papillon ear fringe. Uh, I never have. I've been involved in papillon since I was 14 years old. I have never trimmed their ear fringe. Um, I mean, obviously I've trimmed it for pets, but not for the show ring. Um, yeah, I just, it would look trimmed. It would, there is no good way to do that. Roy asked, do you trim the underline on a Shetland sheepdog? Yes, I do, Roy. I do trim it with thinning shears. Um, if the underline starts looking too trimmed, because you can use thinning shears enough that it looks like you trimmed it with straight scissors, I am then going to go in with my fingers and just like kind of pull the edge just to make it look a little bit more natural. I mean, this is a great time to practice on that because you're not in the ring for a while. So the other thing is maybe I'm going to trim the underline on like my Shetland Sheepdog or my Border Collie, my Collie with my thinning shears like on a Monday. So it does have time to not look quite as neat by the time it gets in the ring on a Friday or a Saturday. Uh, Renate asks, I have a loss of ops, so his hair uh, is thin, 
And if I cut the ends, it will be too short. So this is again, what everybody thinks. They think the hair is already thin. If I cut it, it will be too short. So cut off a baby finger's width, right? Cut off a little tiny bit and you'll be surprised at how much thicker it looks. So I'm not saying cut off everything that looks thin, but cut off up to half an inch, right? Cut off up to half an inch and you'll be surprised at how thick it looks, Renate, I promise you. Hi guys, I hope you enjoyed today's video. Please give us a like, and if you haven't already done so, you can subscribe to our channel below. Also, check out leadingedgedogshowacademy.com for our premium content. We had a lot of fun bringing you all this information. See you soon. Bye.